Hello, protocols, packets, and programs. Whatever category you fall into, we're glad you're listening. Because the only binary thinking around here comes from computers. And if you've been counting CVEs or calculating CVSSs, then you know just how dangerous that binary thinking can be. Which means this week we have another conversation with Kinsella about determining the AppSec metrics to successfully drive effective security programs. Then in the news segment, attackers take over tokens, five flaws take over robots, JavaScript takes over bad UX, security scores take over an engineering culture, and more. Measure once, listen twice, and stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. It's the show to learn the latest tools, techniques, and processes necessary to understand DevOps, application security, and cloud security. Your trusted source for the latest application security news. It's time for Application Security Weekly. SUSE.io makes security tools for everyone. SUSE's flat rate pricing means you can set up SCA and DAST tools for your whole team. No seat counts, no scan limits, and you never have to talk to a salesperson. SUSE integrates with all common CI/CD platforms and supports most popular package managers. And thanks to SUSE's open source vulnerability scanner, license management suite, and SBOM generation capability, you can get back to what you really want to be doing, coding in no time. Visit securityweekly.com slash SUSE. This is episode 193, recorded April 18th, 2022. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and I'm here, as I always am, with John Kinsella. Hello, John. Good morning, and welcome to John and Mike in the Mornings. (laughs) John and Mike in the Mornings. Get your coffee, get your security professional ears on, and we got to workshop that motto a bit, maybe. I don't know. (laughs) Maybe it'll be all about coffee and metrics. But before we get into metrics, we, of course, have some announcements. As always, don't miss your favorite Security Weekly content. Visit securityweekly.com slash subscribe to, of course, subscribe on any of our podcast feeds and have all new episodes downloaded right to your phone or whatever device you listen with. You can also join our mailing list, Discord server, and follow us on social media and our streaming platforms. Then you can join us for a webcast on April 21st to learn how to gain visibility into your enterprise with Sysmon. Join again May 4th, that's an auspicious date, to learn how to choose the right architecture for your application. Live attendees will have the chance to win a $100 Hacker Warehouse gift card. Register at securityweekly.com slash webcasts. And don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and technical trainings at securityweekly.com slash on-demand. So no guest intro this week. Instead, we've got a discussion topic. And the discussion topic is on an article from Phil Venables, someone we've covered half a dozen times, I think, speaking about, yeah, once or twice, speaking about numbers, see how careful we are about our attention to detail here. Uh, But this article was published just over a week ago. The title is 10 Fundamental But Really Hard Security Metrics. Now, the gist of the article is thinking about how to come up with the 20% of possible metrics that can drive 80% of the metric of the improvements we'd like to see in security. So I'll also add that the article has an unspoken assumption that we don't want to spend 100% of our engineering budget on these improvements, yet we're going to also need more than a 0% investment on security. So, John, you've got 50% of this conversation. I'll pick up the other half. Let's see if we can make these numbers add up. So, a list of top 10. Maybe I'll I'll just kind of read through a couple read through them quickly and then we'll unpack this and maybe talk about more general about what good metrics are as well. So, a real quick one through the article. It touches on as I said, some things that are useful to measure or proposing useful to measure about software infrastructure reproducibility, software lifecycle security, time to reboot the company, which is pretty interesting, a, uh, an OODA loop or the OODA spread. So for you Air Force uh, junkies out there, we'll get into that in a little bit. Also talking about the blast radius index, which is probably more for the Army folks out there, a good term. Then system stagnancy, preventive maintenance, control pressure index, and inventory triangulation, or asset inventory. So these are a couple of the items that some of them are self-explanatory. Some of them we'll have to maybe dive into a little bit uh, to, to help with, for those of you who haven't read the article yet. But that's my intro, and I've got a couple that seem priorities to me. 
to dive into, but I, I'm always really eager to dive into the article. But maybe, John, we should talk about first, just set the stage with useful metrics or non-useful metrics. Mm. Or when we just say metrics for you, especially, you know, you're hel- helping run startups. You, you, you're you running on very tight budgets yourselves. Clearly, you can't just be looking at all the metrics out there in the world. You, there, there's got to be a reason for you to care about numbers. Yeah, definitely. It's funny for a... Uh, um I'm not trying to start off with the um, uh, talking about my talks, but the talk I did last week, I was making a joke. Um, oh, what was it? Uh, I need to do a uh, um, a graph that shows the maturity model of maturity models. But it's sort of the same thing as what you're just saying, right? We need a graph to show the maturity of the a maturity model for the different metrics out there, which we use. Um, and it's interesting. So yeah, I think that's a, a, a great lead in what you just said there. Uh, and so let's sort of look at that from a few different points of view. First being, um, you know, you you highlighted the, the military use, right, just to, to say it, uh, or the military phrasing. What we see frequently is, and I don't know if it came originally from sales or marketing, or maybe just from uh, military people coming into to InfoSec and AppSec, but there's quite a lot of um, um, overlay on that, right? And for sort of good, sort of bad. It, it you know, I, I think it's part, I say salesy and marketing because I think it's partially, if I go into someone's office or, you know, someone's putting together a campaign and we talk about, you know, ooh, blast rates, we can help minimize your blast rates. That sounds really great when, uh, you know, we talk about board stuff in, in later on in this uh, in this blog post. Um, you know, it's if you can go into the, the board and say something really hot and exciting and sexy sounding like that, it's like, ooh, cool, blast rate use. Uh, but yeah, so that that's, let's, you know, now I've got the silliness out of the way. Um, some of the interesting aspects of this article as I was thinking about it is some of these things, how you think about them from a large scale organization point of view compared to someone small like me right now, massively different. Um, and and that that's, it's good and bad. I mean, obviously it's good and bad, but I think what's interesting to think about from that point of view is, um, you know, partially, like you said, what do I actually care about? And what do I, what metrics do I either have in my head? Because let's be honest, I'm not tracking them yet. Um, what metrics are in my head or am I thinking about versus um, as the company grows and how, how do we mature the, um, it's not basically maturing just because I'm I'm actually maturing the, the process or the, uh, the analytics or the metric gathering, but it's actually as the company grows and what's needed is, is massively different. Right now, my core drive in life is like, you know, how do I get a customer to sign on to a product so I can go back to the VCs and say, hey, look, traction, mm-hmm. get more money, go back get more customers, hey, look, more traction. Um, but then somewhere in there, how does this play in, right? And how it plays in is you get customers asking in early stage startups, like, why would I want to trust you with, especially in enterprise, right, or B2B, why would I want to trust you with anything I'm doing? Um, well, if I can show you, like, you know, Beside the fact that I'm a co-host of application security, I've been doing this for a while, um, <laughs> be able to say, and that works. Um, but being also able to say, uh, um, you know, well, you know, these are the type of maturity models we have in place. These are the type of things we have. Um, and probably to a degree, uh, some of the things off of this list. But really for, and even for, you know, what is that, the larger companies, what really matters from a customer point of view is, have you thought about it? Have you actually, can you talk intelligently about that you put these pieces into, into place and have a... Um, a plan for why you're doing them. That's that seems what has worked or has had the most uh, purchase from a no pun intended from a interacting with a customer's point of view. If you're doing it for that reason, which is it's important, right? It, it's we always talk about security as a um, a cost center, not so much a um, a profit center. Uh, but at the same time, if we can help close a sale because we've got that security stuff done, I think that's that's valuable. But anyways. Um, this is a fun list. Uh, it's always filled with great stuff. Um, where to start on this list? I mean, I think it's interesting the way he started the, the first few. And this is, it's not purely a security list, right? I mean, it, it, it is. But mm-hmm. when I looked at the first one or two sort of smacked me across the face. And, you know, we talk about the security triad, the CIA, um, uh-oh, uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Ha, I got it. I can still pass my CSSB. Um, but... From you know the the first two or three we have on here software rep- re- <laughs> software reproducibility I can pass my CISSP but I can't speak uh, you know that that's and there you know that's a slightly I had to read to understand what he meant but you know can you reproduce your builds in the CI pipeline um, infrastructure reproducibility uh, if you know and this is 
becoming more, I think, commonplace now as more and more of us are moving to the cloud. So I hope that number's going up. But these, and then, you know, we, we get a little more security focus after the first two, but those first two are really more about availability, at least in my mind. Um, I guess you could say reproducibility is more about integrity. Um, but neither one of them would have been what I would have thought of. Well, I guess supply chain is changing, number one, but still number two definitely would have been something I thought of purely from a security point of view. It's something I believe in very strongly, right? And like it's 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 something we are going really heavily invested in making sure that everything we do we can reproduce from uh, a single command or a single click. Uh, but that that sort of and again, I think number two ties into <coughs> actually it is number four, which is the scary one, uh, right? So you know it'd be interesting to see your take on that. But like time to reboot the company. Uh, takes people a few seconds just to understand what that means again, I think, in a lot of cases. But if your production environment goes down and you have to switch over to DR, uh, presuming you have a DR site somewhere, how long does that take? How much data do you lose? Um, are you working for Atlassian? Uh, you know, so these are all sort of <laughs> core questions. Sorry, I had to throw a dig in there. Um, but that's it, it becomes a thing. I mean, what's interesting to me about this one when I was thinking about it in particular we're now moving out of purely this is becoming a logistics problem it's it's not even so much the security or our infrastructure because yeah i can re i can respin my infrastructure as a cloud as a as a you know cloud native SaaS company i can respin my infrastructure really anywhere in the world in under an hour say 30 minutes but as the data i have grows getting that data to that location is what takes time um, previous company I worked at, we wanted to do an offsite backup, backup our data to uh, one of the cloud providers. And I think we were looking at days just to copy the data across. So that becomes your your bottleneck in a lot of these type of things. And it's like, okay, well, how do you do? I mean, that's good to know. And I think that's part of this article, right, is, is thinking about something like that, finding out what that slow spot is. Now, what can I do about it? Or how can I budget for it? Or what's acceptable to us? Um, you know, I'm forgetting my terms, but back to the CISSP aspect of things, there's the concept of, um, well, I'm really going to screw it up. Maybe it won't pass my CISSP. Um, but there's a concept of, you know, what's an acceptable risk to a company from a monetary point of view versus from a security point of view, or how long are you willing to be down? Um, so one of you out there is, is screaming at your radio right now going, it, this is the phrase, but whatever it is. Um, but so that's sort of, you know, something to think about. I think it's what's really interesting about this is this is these metrics aren't just internal for a company to think about by themselves or the, the security team, but how do you then go and have that discussion back with uh, a board or with, you know, whoever is signing the check? So I think that's a, um, a really interesting way to think about this. And then how do you take this, how do you take these metrics and put them into bite-sized consumable pieces for that, you know, the, the VC that's on your board or the lawyer or whoever else who isn't like day in, day out working with your product? Yeah, you've you hit on a couple of interesting aspects there too about the audience for these metrics because initially you know the the, the primary focus of the article is that as a security team, as a security, you know, as, as a part of leadership working with engineering, mm -hmm. what are the metrics you want to pull out? But you've pointed out the important aspects that what do you also what are the metrics you bring to the board and you are also early on in the discussion talking about you know g getting purchase uh with a wonderful pun with, mm -hmm. with with customers in the sense of you know customers will come with one form or another of a vendor security checklist and probably <laughs> at the top of their checklist is not going to be how reproducible is your software you know how much infrastructure as code have you written but they're going to touch on aspects of these and the the the, the subtext of all those vendor security questionnaires are really just how secure are you? How, why should we trust you or give us some confidence that we can that you're going to have the, the CIA aspects covered of our data and services we're going to give to you? There are um, so so we'll, we'll come back to those audiences in a second. But mm -hmm. yeah, let me dive into maybe that number four time to reboot the company and how that ties in with the availability and the infrastructure because that was the thing that you glommed on to. I think it also ties back to episode Episode 191, uh, I pulled out another article that was early security for startups. And I, that was another one that was about, uh, you know, the author had four items about suggestions for you don't have any security hires yet. You don't have any security budget. Here's some things to, to consider. One of them was ransomware. And the ransomware, of course, has that overlap yes. with 
disaster recovery. Sure, you have backups, but have you tested those backups? So if mm -hmm. we're talking about you know how to prioritize this list, perhaps just investing in that infrastructure as code, that reproducibility or rebooting the company, which can be pretty scary, but possibly more viable for a smaller startup than, you know, after you have, before you have petabytes of data to try to copy, um, that might be those areas to invest in. And I think the other reason I wanted to highlight that kind of kick off with it is that what I like about this list is that there's a very strong engineering aspect to it, meaning engineers are going to need to do something. There's there's actionable items on here, meaning write out, write your things, write your write things, how, how, how cleverly descriptive that is. <laughs> We're basically design your application with infrastructure as code, have those types of processes rather than just here's the checklist that security is bringing to you. And with that, I'm going to jump down and then I'm going to do the opposite of what you did, John. I'm going to go down the bottom of the list and work backwards from there and that inventory triangulation so that's our of course the asset inventory the the easy to say always hard to do and now to add some perspective here you know this is phil venables who comes from you know CISO of google cloud uh mm. goldman sachs in other words organizations that are not wanting for investment in money or people in engineering or security engineering teams but this still tops, you know, this still lands on that list because it's still a hard problem. And for me, prioritization, I do love the idea of number seven and eight, uh, basically that system stagnancy and preventive maintenance. Meaning if you can get on top of a dependabot type of solution, or at least have some type of engineering discipline where your dependency pack, your package dependencies, you're keeping them up to date. You're hopefully, and I'll fingers crossed, this is this is where I fall into the, the optimist aspect, is hopefully you're dealing with a lot fewer just distracting vulns because you have the the, the discipline of uh, this package is is old, let's just bump the, the bump the version number. Or Rails 5 is going EOL, let's get on to Rails 6 before it is actually EOL, or you know, choose your poison. So those are some areas that I think are also pretty universal, regardless of whether you're big company or small company, that you do need to pay attention to that inventory and patch management. Um, I'm going to dig into the inventory part for a second because I think this this brings out something which is sort of interesting around. Oh, do I want to go this wide? Yeah, sure. Um, not just infosec, not just software engineering, but really IT. Uh, from a point of view of, you know, I can't remember if I told the story on here or not before, but many many years ago when I was um, working in the data center world, I was doing a tour to a bunch of engineers, like actual like you know. Uh, licensed engineers, probably, I don't know, um, uh, Mechies or something. And then we did Q&A after we did a tour at the data center. And one of them raised his hand and he asks me, so tell me about the um, uh, some of the engineering uh, budgets which you have to either over-engineer or how do you actually, what are, what are the calculations you do, say, for example, on our backbone to make sure that we have uh, plenty of bandwidth? And I just started laughing, mm -hmm. right? It's like, Dude, this is internet. We don't, we don't do anything like that. It's like, you know, we put fiber down and we hope that's enough. And, you know, we watch our squiggly lines and if they get too high, then we think about it. But um, <laughs> that that's sort of the difference between, I think, a lot of, you know, and we've, we've gained sophistication since then. That was, what, 99. Um, we've gained sophistication since then, but still in a lot of ways, just keeping track of the rabbits in the data center is pretty difficult for us to do, right? You know, what, where, what inventory... Um, and I'll bring it back to, you know, think about other industries out there. Uh, um, I don't know, SAP is on my mind a lot recently, I don't know why, but like they've made a pretty decent chunk of their businesses around, you know, material management and inventorying of large, massive enterprise systems. Um, and there's others out there in that space too, obviously. But when I saw this first, the inventorying all the things, the first thing that made me think of, if folks want, you know, some um, happy, fun reading or watching out there, uh, Formula One team, Red Bull Racing, uh, they did probably two or three years ago a, a video on the life cycle of a part, and I think it was a bolt, um, from the moment that it is being designed and engineered on an engineer's workstation in CAD, like, you know, what's the thread pitch, how long, what diameter, all these type of things, what force is going to be on it, how light can we make it, because it's a race car. And then that goes, so at that point it's given like a, you know, a part number, there's a version of the CAD drawing, there's all these type of things, right, which mm -hmm. sounds a little bit like an S-bomb. And then the, the video shows through, you know, okay, let's go over to actually CNCing this, that serial number follows it, 
Um, the, the design papers literally fall along along the way. And then from CNC, it goes over to test. They test, make sure it works. Then it gets eventually gets put into a um, little plastic bag with a uh, sticker on it with all the appropriate details for that specific version. Um, and then it's put into a cart and they bring it out and they put it on, the, you know, it eventually shows up at the racetrack. But being able to track your bolts on your car at that level of detail, right? And obviously that's expensive and they're doing it for a reason because they need to figure out if something failed, why and how did it fail? And, and this mm -hmm. is sort of preaching a little bit to the masses now because we talked a lot about this last year for, for S-Bomb, but I think it's good to see outside examples occasionally. Um, but coming back to this, yeah, we can't track, you know, where containers and Kubernetes, you know, where is that vulnerable, which version is vulnerable? And it just, it, there's so much space to improve in a lot of these things. Um, but then the question is, since we are in a way doing a version of that race car engineering and that we have a balance between uh, we need speed versus lightness. In our case, it's, you know, speed versus cost or security versus cost. Everything has trade-offs. Uh, but that, again, it's something to bring back to the board and go, hey, look, you know, we've got, we're able to tell um, with certainty uh, where 85, 95% of the electron cloud is. We can't pinpoint the electron exactly. If you need to do that, we can spend more money on it and we'll, we'll know where the electrons are, or, you know, security issues are, but we're going to there's going to be a bit of a you know a cost involved with that. We won't be able to instead create you know some new feature in the product. Um, and again, I think yeah. these these are interesting things to think about. Yeah, keep, it, feel free to stick your nose in. Um, yeah, let me jump on that that aspect real quick. That you're talking about cost of you know that that the, those trade offs because mm -hmm. one of the other resources I linked in here too were the the four metrics I wanted to highlight from um, Dora, uh, the the DevOps yeah. side of the house, and their metrics are deployment frequency, lead time for changes, change failure rate, for example, how many bolts went bad, um, and time to restore service. Meaning you know getting to that availability aspect they were talking about early on. The reason I highlighted that is that security, yes, it can be looked at as a cost center. We have to spend time. But maybe one of the ways as well as describe as we're rolling out controls, rolling out features to help with one of these areas of this list of 10 metrics, you can also say, look, we deployed this, we've improved our inventory, or we've improved our uh, reproducibility for the infrastructure or our even our software builds, but we haven't impacted the lead time for changes, the amount of time it takes a commit to get to production. Or maybe we've only mm -hmm. reduced that time by a you know a decimal percentage. So we've we've added 60 seconds to the deploy time. Or our deployment frequency frequency went down from multiple deployments to, you know, double digits down to single digits in a single day, but we can still deploy multiple times within a single day. So that's also mm -hmm. an aspect I wanted to highlight in the sense of here's how we can show that the the cost, if you will, on engineering time uh, wasn't necessarily bad, or perhaps to show this is what you can strive for about how to say, yes, we do want to add security, but we don't want to drag the rest of our engineering and business and, you know, revenue along with it. So so back over to you, John, and to you, you, you're on a good roll. So I don't want to, I, I was flagging you in for a pit stop, but uh, you're back on the, on the loop. Go fast, turn left. What have we got? Cool, cool. We, we got a good new set of tires. Let's keep going. Um, <laughs> I can't remember who it was. I saw it last week, one of the vendors, I can't remember one of the monitoring uh, vendors. I can't remember if it was the purple one or the blue one or someone else, but they now have a product which allows you to, that'll plug into your GitHub Actions or whatever your, well, probably not whatever, but a, a collection of different CI tools which you have out there. And then they're able to start monitoring and reporting metrics off of that. And I think it comes back specifically to what you said, which is, mm. it caught my eye. Again, it's not catching my eye enough that I'm willing to pay for it yet. But being able to see, hey, our build time's increased, but this is why? Oh, I'd love to have that, right? I mean, as we get bigger and as, as that build time actually becomes painful for us and we're, and we're slowing down, um, either deployments or functionality or, you know, like our, our time to reboot gets changed. Um, that That's really interesting. If I can see specifically, and you can go through and check out your logs and all, you know, it, the tools make things easier. You're usually not coming up with something from scratch. But if I'm able to see that level of detail quickly and visually like, wow, hey, look, suddenly our one of our steps is taking twice as long as it used to and that's causing something else to break, um, that's that's very valuable, I think, in certain ways, if you care about this, uh, if you care about the maturity and what's going on with it. Um, but keep going. One of the other ones, you know, I was thinking about when I was looking at this list, and we talked about it a little bit already, and you were asking about, you know, startup versus uh, public company sort of mm -hmm. thing, um, system stagnancy. 
Um, I ain't got none of that. Uh, if I do, I've got a really big problem. You know, my what's stagnant for me is if I look at a Git commit and it's seven months old. <laughs> you know, that that's stag. That's where it's like, oh wow, we need to change that. That's some of the older code we wrote. Um, but let me I, actually. Yeah. I was going to say, let me ask a question there, because there's also an aspect of it, it makes sense that startups need to be making, you know, rolling out features quickly. But I can also imagine that there might be trade offs in the sense of, well, we want to get this out fast. So we're going to roll this out with a, a, a Node.js on the back end rather or Rails or Go. How much does the tech stack influence? Well, we're going to have a, a non stagnant system, but we know we're, we may have to re implement it, re architect it in the future as we scale up. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm trying to. Uh, redact some details on the an example. <laughs> um, I'll say it this way: we, we've got an example where uh, you know two of the three co-founders are are security nerds, um, mm -hmm. and we initially our not initially still our our admin interface in the systems is in a completely separate um, uh, website. You know, it, it's not so we've designed things very clearly so that. If you get, you just can't get super admin on the public SaaS. It just doesn't exist. Um, it's completely separate, you know, set of services on separate APIs on separate. Everything is like way over left field. You just can't get to it. So you can't get that access um, with a separate authentication system, uh, mm -hmm. which is requires me every time I use it to jump through hoops. Um, it is me, the security guy saying it's already annoying me. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that's one of the, that's a perfect example. Like, right. It's, 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 I'm I'm looking almost every week for excuses. I think I've talked about it here before, but I'm looking almost every week for excuses to get rid of that so I can make it easier. But what that's now, it's there's so many hoops I have to jump through that, um, and it was picked for, it was, it's interesting, right? Because this one, it wasn't picked for the examples that we're talking about of, of um, cost engineering for uh, um, a startup. It was picked for the reasons of uh, the security nerds were giving themselves too much leeway and instead of just get stuff done but that actually makes it more difficult for me to put a, a web ui on there um to be able to interact with it for uh -huh. new users who don't have that level of access so there's a few different things that this <clears throat> authentication system is causing and we're, we're working around them but that's sort of a, a far example um you know the most common thing you'll hear uh, an early stage at least the ones i've been in startups say is we'll do it now and then when we have you know money to hire you know some junior engineers <laughs> right. or some interns we'll let them fix it in the summer that's where the legacy stuff comes from in a, in a, um, a startup so from the point of view of you know i'm just implementing enough right now that i can get this done for a customer we're not expecting them to ask for i don't know um uh, a detailed settings page which allows them to really adjust and tweak what's going on in there but you mm -hmm. know we'll add that you know is that type of we're, we're very good at the, the, the game of kicking cans down roads. Um, how does that come back to security? I think it's what's interesting to think about there. Um, it, it's tough, right, for me to answer that one since it's it's that's one of the core things I think about at every turn is what is the security aspect of this? We're probably too secure in, in almost every single possible way. Um, I've had people at previous company actually teeth and ash because I was making things too secure. And in hindsight, I think I was right. I think I don't think I was going overboard, but still I can see, you know, it, this comes back to that. Um, when you go to the board or the, or the executive team, you know, are what's, what's your pace of being able to crank stuff out? Are you actually moving quick enough to get that traction and go back to the VC and get more money? And is that hamster wheel spinning fast enough? Um, that's probably the thing I have to think about personally. Um, I'd, I'd like to think I do a pretty good job of it, but you know, time will tell. Uh, but you know, that sort of ties in also to preventative maintenance. That same concept mm -hmm. of, I think, budgeting time and actually putting that into your timeline. Uh, you know, if you know any modern, like I shouldn't say any modern. Hopefully, all of our listeners are in relatively modern engineering environments where you've got a CI system. Um, you've got Scrum or some form of uh, engineering uh, software development life cycles. And then the question becomes, uh, how do you budget for some of these things, right? Are you, are, you act are you actively leaving X hours per sprint or per month or per quarter to be able to go through and do the preventative maintenance? Easy for me to say. Um, someone recently was talking, oh, it was actually, I don't think we covered this article. Uh, or maybe we did. 
maybe in 190. There was an article recently from Go talking about how, mm. from the Go team, talking about how um, uh, Go doesn't have quite the same type of uh, supply chain issues as other software ver- other software languages <laughs> does because they actually, by default, pin the version in the go.mod file. Um, but still, that means somebody has to go through and, and update the vendoring around that, and that's when you know the, the bricks start crumbling. But that's something that you desperately need to do it. Otherwise, um, I use the, the use case of you want a new feature in one of those libraries, and you update, and all of a sudden, everything breaks. So it's it's any of these languages have trade-offs, good or bad, one way or another, about how do you, how do you deal with these things? You can... You can lock in now um, and sort of get the the good price now while you're at it, or you can have the um, I don't know for some reason I'm thinking of a, a, a this will make sense to Americans a uh, um, a mortgage joke if you can have a floating interest rate on your mortgage and then like you know deal with it down the road, uh, but um, yeah now I'm sort of grasping at straws, Mike. So uh, I'm going to shut up for a second. <laughs> <laughs> We'll pull you back. Uh, no, I think that, that, that you, you've touched on things that, you know, aspects that, that tie several of these uh, items together. For example, as you were describing the perhaps burdensome, you know, even for you, uh, mm-hmm. you know, admin capabilities, that does still go into that blast radius index, I, I think, mm-hmm. concept. The idea of how many people have privileged access to the system. Or, you know, to, tying that into the infrastructure as code aspect, how how many people need human access to production system in order to debug something? Or can they just mm-hmm. execute, you know, execute scripts, execute something that pulls back uh, information for them? And all these it come into that idea of just reducing the, the the spread and the proliferation of to 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 throw in some more military jargon proliferation hmm. of admin access um but one thing as we are running out of time on this because th- there's so much to talk about with metrics there this article does link to some other things that Phil's r- written that also highlights yes. another aspect that you were touching on uh, security for more than security's sake and as he describes it adjacent benefits and this mm-hmm. is an interesting article as well it's from 2000 it's 2020 but it points out to also ways to think about these metrics and position them so that they are enabling the business or that you're explaining, we did this security control, this security step, but it demonstrates how we did become more efficient. And either that is saying we've added controls, but we haven't lost, you know, how long it takes for a Git commit to get into production, talking about, you know, that that DevOps metric, or we're more efficient on something else, meaning that we actually no longer need humans to SSH into systems to collect information to debug systems. We have more automation around that. And those, I think, are, can be both compelling engineering stories as well as stronger security stories. So I wanted to highlight that, too, to help us think about why are we choosing these metrics and avoid those ide- uh, those uh, squishy metrics or perhaps just even non-helpful metrics of that boil down to something like, don't write insecure code or the optimistic <laughs> version, write secure code. Not really a metric. Uh, the metrics here get into, you know, percentage. It's talking about coverage or percent changes, um, things like that, as opposed to even just we had this many vulns and now we want to drive all of our vulns down to zero. That's not going to happen. What we're talking about here is adding controls and improving the maturity of processes. So those are some of the areas I also wanted to bring into the discussion as we think about what the metrics look like. Yes. Um there's another link in there which I like to. I think it's near the top. Um, cyber, uh, another link to another mm-hmm. of his amazing mm-hmm. blog posts, Cybersecurity: The Board's Perspective. Um, I don't know why I'm on the, the board trip today, but I am. Uh, and it talks through it's uh, five points talking through how does the board think about like you know when the security guy comes along or the engineer, engineering leader comes along and says we got this is our security issue. It's, it's probably sort of the the, the yin to the yang of. Um, the, uh, the article we're talking about today, sort of like, you know, how, how do they, they think through and think about that? Um, so just a more good reading for folks. But I think, um, let's see, going back to what you are just talking about, uh, there was something in there, but it'll come back to me. Um, I also want to give a little bit of time to that article you found um, from Chime, um, which I think... Uh-huh. Does an interesting job of talking about it from sort of the larger scale of things. Um, 
in 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 what so there, there's a few different aspects in here so the, i'm going to jump over to it so um uh company chime which i had to look up myself is not amazon chime the um messaging app they have it's it's a another uh i guess what do you call them neobank uh and they got a internal tool called monocle which basically they are it's actually really it's an interesting read um, so what they've done is they've created this tool which goes and, and looks at their uh, internal software repos across a bunch of different um, metrics uh, and then sort of uh, you know puts together a score for that for that project with an attempt with a target to try and get the to try and gamify the engineers um, and it seems like it's working for them which is pretty neat but what so the first thing which called out which really sort of made my eyes light up and make put a smile on my face was they don't just put a, a grade there but you're able to click on it see through which parts were missing or which were less excuse me less than ideal and then have an explanation of how to actually get those things straightened out right and this is something we're unfortunately usually horrible about in security is like we'll give you the report and going hey here's your 1500 things to fix but you know, you want to do something about it? Oh, that's my hourly rate of 375 uh, if you actually want to hear, you know, how, how you actually fix these things. And that's useless to most people. Um, but at the same time as I was reading through this, and then he hit it at the end, uh, I was having this feel of, I don't know if I hit you like this, Mike, but I had this feel of like, okay, this is awesome. You created this security tool to do this. And I've, I've seen this both, at, you know, my previous startup, we'd go in sometimes to, if we went into a large organization that had a mature security team uh, and try to tell them, try to sell them a container security product, they'd be like, "We've got you know these three guys over here. They know container security like the back of their hand. We're not buying something from you. Like, Thanks, looks cool, but we're just not buying it." Uh, and this is sort of a little bit of that. Um, and you know, companies are always going to have some level of um, "wasn't built here" type uh, um, mentality, but at the same time, I don't think. These guys could have bought something off the shelf to do it. Uh, and then down near the bottom, there was a, where was that line? I think it was in advice for security teams. Yeah, um, paragraph heading advice for security teams. If your team doesn't have time to build something like Monocle, I'd encourage you to think about the following, where the following intersect. And it's like three or four points, but it's like, Jesus Christ, guys, if everyone has to go and build Monocle, we've got a massive problem. Um, and that's, you know, it's, I, I, I think there's there's good stuff in here. They've done really great stuff. It's a lot of stuff for us to all engineer. Excuse me, all learn. I don't want us to all engineer. That's my my point. Um, but you know, it's 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 a nice article to go along with. You know, what we have from Phil of saying like these are the things to think about, and then here's some execution on that. I think what I'd really, really, really love um, is to see how can we. Not either. It could be open source. Could be uh, the vendors actually learning how to do this stuff better. But how can we um, not all have to rebuild the same wheel? Uh, there's nothing special about this wheel. Um, I think how we think about the wheel takes a little bit different thinking, maybe a different coffee. But um, I don't know. That was sort of my my not my takeaway, but unfortunately, the, one of the the larger points in my mind. Yeah, I think in our other massive problem is that we're running towards the end of this segment. and uh, But you've given us a great way to segue into the new segment. But uh, I want to thank you, John, for telling us, especially the, the angles you're talking about, bringing us to the board because you're never boring about it. Um, we're going to take a quick break now and return with news of the week. <laughs> 